Hi and welcome again for this fifth video lecture in this series on uh, digital forensics. And uh, again with me, Joachim Shevrestad, lecturer at the University in Skövde. Some of the students that are watching these videos are from, from the University of Skövde, I'm sure, since I'm forcing you to, and you have to do it for your home exam. And if there is anyone else joining us, uh, good for you and fun for us. So this step we will talk about live forensics, which is uh, basically about examining devices that are turned on. And as discussed, uh, live, uh, doing these live examinations introduces considerations regarding the integrity of the evidence, because since we're working with devices that are turned on uh, in the real state, uh, going on and looking around basically, it, we will in some way affect the data that is stored on the device. And I know that some laws and regulations may have issues with this, but where, where some other jurisdictions allows you to, as long as you document what you're doing. Uh, however, the good thing about live forensics is that it does give us a few extra superpowers. Uh, one of them is that we're, uh, we, we do get able to collect what is called volatile data. And volatile data as a term refers to data that is quickly changing and, and also data that is usually discarded when, uh, when power is removed from the device. So uh, volatile data in a forensic sense maybe primarily refers to the ability to document what is currently on screen. And doing that is very powerful. I mean, uh, take a case where, where you're involved in, well, the drug case that we're, we're talking about all the time and you're called to do a live forensic examination uh, of a computer that the suspect were, was sitting in front of when he was arrested. If you get able to get the ability to document what's going on on the screen, then that's a very strong evidence that it's also something that the suspect was, was doing. And maybe there are some web browser up where he's writing an email about uh, selling drugs or there is a Bitcoin wallet up where you can see a lot of Bitcoin transactions relating to drugs and so on, so on and so, so forth. And the second thing that we can do is get information about the current user, the current network connections, um, what processes that are active on the computer and so on. And this is also very good because this is the user that is currently logged in. This is the network connections that are currently on, the programs that are currently being used. And that is a strong, indications that, a strong indication that it's stuff that the person that was sitting in front of the computer is using. Uh, next thing we can do is get a memory dump and memory dump that's basically dumping the information that is currently in the random access memory of the computer or the computer memory. And why is this good? Well, for one, it's information that was put there since the last time the computer was started. So it's relevant uh, or current information. And uh, second, the thing with memory or the thing with encrypted data uh, maybe is that when you have encrypted data, it's stored in a format that's unreadable, as we discussed before. But when you have to read it, you have to decrypt it. And the decrypted version of the encrypted data will be stored temporarily in mem memory so that you can read it, show it on screen. And for that reason, there may be traces of decrypted versions of encrypted data in the memory. And that makes the memory dump a very good resource of forensic evidence. Uh, the fourth thing we can do is that we can analyze if any encryption software is used. Maybe this suspect is using TrueCrypt or BitLocker or something else to encrypt his hard drive. And the thing is that when we get to the computer, it's turned on, it's logged on, all the data is currently decrypted. And that means that if we can find encryption software and we can detect that the hard drive is uh, encrypted, then we still have the ability to do a forensic disk image of the decrypted version of the data because the data is currently uh, currently decrypted because the computer is being used. Uh, on the other hand, let's say that this, decrypt, this encrypted data was brought into the lab and you found uh, that a computer had a header saying it was a TrueCrypt drive, maybe it was a 20 character long password, you would likely never get a chance to examine that data. 
So if you find encryption software when you're doing a live examination, you can evaluate uh, if there is any encrypted data that is currently decrypted. Maybe it's an encrypted volume and it's and the computer is running. Maybe it's some encrypted file that is currently visible on file on screen. Maybe it's some encrypted partition that is currently mounted in a decrypted state. Then we get a chance to collect it using FTK Imager or some other tool. So. Um, in, in the book that this uh, lecture series is actually based on, my own forensic book, uh, I, I published a process or an overview model of uh, the live forensic uh, process, including what's expected from a forensic expert uh, in a house search. Maybe the text is a little bit small, but then you, you will have to zoom. So from my point of view, there is a three major steps to uh, a forensic live investigation or for the work that a forensic expert is conducting during a house search because oftentimes or every now and then at least you are as a forensic expert asked to participate in the house search uh, there may be a case where you found let's not take a drug case let's let's take let's take let's take a murder case there's been a murder case, uh, the suspected murder has been identified. They have, for some strange reason, reason to believe that the computers are interesting. So they say, hey, you, Mr. Forensic guy, uh, can you join us for this, um, for this arrest and do a house search and look for everything digital? And you say, sure. So what happens then is that uh, we begin in the preparation step. We have to come prepared in some way. And then you see the little orange boxes that are the, they are boxes that indicate processes that you should uh, be doing on, on beforehand. They should all already be completed before you even get asked. And that is first create a process, uh, which is create a general understanding of what you want to do. And if I'm moving my mouse into here, the general process of a live investigation, that's basically this, everything that's in conducting. How do we generally do things? Who's doing what? What softwares are we using? So on and so forth. Uh, when we created our process, then we're gonna get a response kit. And a response kit is basically a set of hardware and software tools that we need to use. So just assemble what you need in order to follow the process that you created. Uh, you will definitely need something. Maybe you will need a write blocker. You will need some device to extract data from cell phones. Uh, maybe you need some tools like FTK Imager, which is great for memory extraction or doing forensic disk images. Maybe you need uh, Paladin or maybe you need SleuthKit or maybe you need whatever. Uh, assemble the things, consider what you need to follow your process and assemble everything into a response kit, put it in a bag and have it ready to go. Uh, because uh, one way that you're called to do a house search is that you're called two weeks in advance. There is a suspect that you can uh, examine do you're looking, looking him or her up on Facebook and so on and so forth. And then you will have time to assemble your things because you know when to do stuff and it's two weeks from now. So, hey, lots of time. But maybe even more common is that you call, get a call from an investigator saying, hey, there is a computer turned on here. Can you get uh, to this location that is uh, some 20 miles away? And you just have to run because you had, have to be there five minutes ago so that it doesn't go into hibernation or something. And then it's very good if you have your response kit ready to go. So orange boxes, create a process, get a response kit. Those are the overall, if you will, uh, uh, steps in the preparation phase. Uh, then there is also a preparation phase that is more for, for a specific case. I'm going to see if I can actually raise my screen here a little bit so that I can stand with you because I'm getting a little bit tired in my legs, something like that. I see that the sound is still working. The computer is sounding weird, but we're not caring about that too much. Uh, so, in the preparation that is more case-specific, there is always first the step of being requested, being asked by someone to take part in the house search, and that is the first thing. Uh, it doesn't always happen on beforehand, but if it does, then you will have a chance to do something that is very important, which is learning about the case. Because I can tell you from doing uh, several, well, maybe not hundreds, but at least... Uh, a big bunch of house searches in different environments that if you get the chance to learn the case you are one more comfortable two more uh, likely to be successful and learning the case in this sense meaning learning what the case is about because different cases have sort of 
different expectations or you can expect different things from different cases so if you're doing um, if you're doing the murder case you you may not know what to expect but if you're doing a child pornography case you know that you're going to search for a lot of uh, storage devices and you know that a lot of it uh, may be encrypted if you're doing um, search relating to a online drug scam you know that it's the same if you're doing a, a house search in a case that's uh, related to someone sneak uh, taking sneak pictures of naked ladies then you know that you're going to look for a spy pen so learn the case that will help you learn what to expect uh, also learning the case involves learning about the suspects so is there a suspect that you can search uh, search on Google, uh, search on Facebook, learn a little bit about what is he doing, what is he working about with, what is his interest. Uh, maybe he's, um, I'm not going to be too stereotypical here, but maybe he's a sport jock. He doesn't know too much about computer. And then you can draw the conclusion that his computer is most likely not encrypted. But on the other hand, he might be an IT guru that is, uh, well, I don't know, running the internal storage server on Google or something. He will know everything about encryption and you need to come prepared to handle that. Uh, when learning the case, you may need to do some additional preparation work, and update your response kit, get ready mentally to handle encryption or, uh, well, get ready mentally to handle a specific scene uh, or scenery. Uh, I can tell you that the looks of, uh, of the living room of someone that is uh, heavy user of narcotics looks a bit different than someone who's the CEO of a big business in general. So that's the preparation that we can do if we're lucky. And next step becomes the conduction phase where you're actually conducting the house search. And the live investigation that this, uh, this lecture is about is actually just a part of conducting the house search. There is a little bit more to it. What might be most scary for you as a forensic expert on your first house search is that you're actually entering a house where one or more suspects may live or at least may be at the moment. And it's not your job to go in there on your own. Uh, the first step of the conduction phase is to secure the area, making sure that there is, uh, there is no one there that's going to point, point a gun at you and that's a task that's handled by the police. Uh, the next phase is to locate computers um, and yeah, well, you're going to know where they are, right? And when you're located a computer, you have to ensure that they stays on. Because as we know, if we find encrypted computers, if we're going to be able to extract uh, data from them, they have to stay on uh, and preferably not go into hibernation. And that's why a common way to handle those first three steps is that if you're going into an area, you notify all the officers uh, and yourself and everyone that's going in to secure the area, To you notify everyone to look for computers that are turned on and if anyone finds one, they should go just move the mouse around uh, carefully or something to ensure that the computer stays on. I know that there are all of those um, People out there saying that, well, maybe there's a death switch saying that, well, if you turn uh, turn the mouse a little bit to the right, the computer will turn off. Or if you hit uh, the, the wrong button, it will turn off. And I'm saying, well, yeah, there is. But the thing is that if you locate the computers and do nothing, then they will most likely definitely turn off. So it's better to move the mouse around than do nothing. Because in my personal experience, I haven't even heard about a case where moving the mouse around turns off the computer. However, I've heard about hundreds of cases and millions of computers where doing nothing to the computer turns the computer off, I promise you. So make sure that you begin with securing the area, locating computers and ensure that the computer stays on, but leave that to the police officers, especially if it seems to be or if you can expect a hostile environment. And now then, when we've ensured that the computers are on, it's time to do the live investigation. And I'm going to stop there for a brief second and say that the next steps are to document the area, which is very important. Document where everything is. Document uh, what you're seizing, where you seized it from, how it was positioned, and so on and so forth. Do it in writing. Do it with photography. Look for other devices, devices that are turned off, uh, USB drives, old cell phones, uh, old hard drives, and so on and so forth, and do some finishing tasks, write things up, take additional fo fo photographies or whatnot. 
Some people claim that you should document the area bef uh, and maybe even look for other devices before you go into the live investigation, but I say otherwise. I say start with the live investigation as soon as the area is secure because you never know when the computer is going to be turned on. You do not know if the computer is remote controlled. You do not know if there is a death switch saying that you should hit escape every five minutes uh, or something else. So go, uh, go into your live investigation as soon as possible. Okay, let's go into the live investigation then. And let's talk a little bit about what the purpose of doing a live investigation is. Uh, and the purpose is of course to secure volatile data and to ensure that you secure uh, any data that's encrypted. So if there is volatile data, which there is on a turn on computer, we want that. And if there is any, uh, any hard drives or any partitions or any files that are encrypted and they are currently decrypted, we want to get them. Um, and how do we do this? Well, the thing is that about get, gathering volatile data, we have to understand one thing, and that is that, first of all, it can crash the computer. Uh, I've heard about memory dumps crashing computers. I've heard about uh, other tasks crashing the computer as well. And if the computer crashes, then we can't get anything else because we're, we're pretty much screwed. And we also have to know, as we said, that every task that we do leaves traces. And they leave traces in volatile data and they leave traces on secondary storage device like the hard drive. And this, these are things that we have to know. Uh, for that reason, I say that the first thing we need to do is secure any volatile data that we can uh, secure in a safe way. Uh, that means to begin with document active programs. Uh, secondary, check for encrypted files and disks. Those are, uh, those are tasks that pretty much only require us to take photographies and have a look around. When we do this, carefully write down what you're doing so that you can trace back your step. If someone says, well, on the day that the computer was seized, it seemed to have visited a forum where selling narcotics or murdering people was discussed, uh, maybe it was the forensic expert. And then if you ta taped or you photo photographed and wrote down what you did, you can carefully say that, no, I didn't, this is what I did. Uh, when we did this, next thing is to perform safe tasks to collect volatile data. And that is collecting volatile data in ways that we, from experience and from knowledge, know will not crash the computer. Uh, one of those ways is to collect uh, registry hives and uh, RAM memory using the tool called FTK Imager. I've used FTK Imager hundreds of times my, myself, never crashed a computer. I never heard of anyone using FTK Imager uh, and crashing a computer when harvesting memory. So that's safe. Uh, when we did that, we can secure data from potentially encrypted disks, files and folders. And I want to tell you that the reason that I'm choosing to uh, collect memory before I collect uh, encrypted disks is that correct is that collecting data from encrypted disks that's time consuming i mean if we have if we find out that there is a 1 terabyte large disk that's currently encrypted we're looking at well maybe 24 hours of data collection and first of all that takes a lot of time second of all doing all of that since the process requires us to write the data on the disk to a disk of our own that's a lot of writing and that will contaminate the random access memory heavily uh, maybe to the degree where the random access memory isn't really valuable anymore. So, and as I said, collecting the memory is usually quite safe, or in my experience, always safe. So secure memory, collect encrypted hard drives, and then if we want to do any more, uh, well, experimental tasks to uh, collect volatile data, do it as the very last task, and then finally turn off the computer and the live investigation is done. Uh, go on then to document the area, and it is actually important to uh, to document how things were connected, where things was, and so on and so forth. And the thing is that this is seen as uh, as the way to do a good live for, uh, live investigation, a good house search uh, in a sound way. Uh, and that means that if you don't document the area, that will mean that you do a bad investigation. And if you're in court and someone says how was how did a computer look? 
then you want to say, well, I don't remember, but I have a photograph graph of it. And looking at page three, I'm sure it was black. If you can say that, then you did good. But if you say, I have no idea, I was in a rush, I didn't have time to document, then the defender will say, what else did you miss? And being in court and not being able to answer the question, what else did you miss? That's bad. So document the area. Next up, look for other devices. And that's basically looking through cupboards, looking to lockers, looking through, to ev through everything that you can find in search of other carriers of digital evidence. Maybe there is police officers next to you that look for other things and uh, then you'll just have to work alongside each other. Uh, my personal uh, opinion is that the best way to work is have a police officer that is documenting things for you and you can just say uh, evidence number one USB thumb drive evidence number two computer write it down did you photograph it nice 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 you're writing it in later everyone's happy especially me so finishing tasks I don't know what it is but at times you have to maybe clear something up turn some something off have a last uh, last final look let the dog back in or whatever and after that you're going home to the lab uh, I've also included a final step in this process, which is afterthoughts, uh, where I strongly encourage you to consider what you did and think about what you did and how you conducted a live search and the whole how search. Uh, because, and that will begin with documenting the search. That should always be done in a PM or a report where you write down what you did, what you found. Uh, tr this is to be able to trace back your steps uh, at a later stage. Next, it's quite useful to discuss the process. How did we experience this house search? Uh, what can be done better? What was good? So on and so forth. And then you use that discussion to improve the process that you created in the first, first orange box. Uh, that's basically what I have to say about live searches uh, or house searches and live investigations. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, post them in the comments field.